Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we sit Yay. back, relax, take that midweek break, and talk about some of the stranger things, the weirder things, possibly just the fun things. We're just tempting them now. Going on. Yes. <laughs> In Linux and open source. Hey, everyone. I'm Ben Stone, joined every week by Jill Bryant and Pedro Montes. And the great home, man. What's new? What's going on? Pedro, I know you were threatening to... Uh, I don't think you were threatening. You you were just sitting around. You you were having that thing people get after a certain amount of time of like, I need to destroy something beautiful. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and um, well, it got to a point where my thirty uh, seven hundred X was getting a bit too toasty. The T die was crossing north of uh, seventy Celsius while gaming, mm. and that was not. <laughs> Uh, that was not Did you acceptable? open the case? And no. Like, Wait a minute. Are you an Intel CP? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. The, I, I kept sensors on and I was looking at like the rest, like the uh, most of the cores. It's like, oh, 38, 40, 40 something. All right. T die 70. It's like, no, no, can't have that. No. Got to do something about it. So I went to look at the, the uh, like, maybe get a new case, one with better ventilation. They're all stupidly expensive, like every mm -hmm. single bit of IT equipment right now. So it's like, wait a second, I have a Dremel. So <laughs> I took a Dremel to the front of my case. <laughs> and look that's at, what it used to look like. Look at gorgeous case that, <laughs> you know, Black engineered, well-built. And here comes Sir Hackslot. And... <laughs> That's what it looks like now. <laughs> Aw, it turned out nice, Pedro. I like it. <laughs> the cut wasn't perfect because I, I'm not that handy um, for a big scale project like that with the Dremel. So uh, there are a couple of chunks of extra plastic that shouldn't have been missing that are. But mm. uh, nothing a little bit of uh, Gorilla Tape around the edge of the whole thing uh, doesn't fix. And yeah, <laughs> it does a very good job of getting gear into the case, straight through to, to the GPU and the CPU. And while gaming, instead of 70, it hits 60 now. Okay, so. <laughs> nice. You're, you're, you're using tape. Uh, what you need to look for is um, window molding, sealant. Or liquid gasket. I thought about that too. Mm. Well, very good. Stay away from like the variable viscous fluid that you have to wait to harden. That the, <laughs> is, is like nice. And I used to use that all the time when I was making holes inside the computers in the mid to late nineties. I'm like, oh look, I'm doing a plexiglass <laughs> window and just, just, just and put it on. I'm just gonna really. It's side like, window hipster. <laughs> you were right, mom. It was a phase. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> we all go through the case mod modding phase. <laughs> oh, well, I got this new bright pink pop filter for my mic, and now it's on the mic and not external, so I can see better, <laughs> which is nice. Bright pink, you said. <laughs> it is actually pink. It's all, it's almost the same color as the the chair, but it's it's showing more a little more red on the camera. Mm. But it is actually a very pink color. So what color is the pink chair then? <laughs> <laughs> it's. It's more like a uh, magenta color. It's it's got more blue in it. Where the mic the mic muff has a little bit more red in it than blue. So that's why it comes across as a little red, but it has it is actually pink. So and and I've also been having fun <laughs> going through the game demos I downloaded in the Steam Summer Game Festival last week. That's been a lot of fun. Found a lot of really cool games that way and and I'm looking forward to Steam and Valve doing that again, because that was awesome. Got found lots of good new games. Yay! Right on. <laughs> I've been playing with a bunch of stuff. Uh, right before the show, the uh, UPS guy, I know I got my little text alert, uh, <laughs> building a little test in the iBox for some in stuff here at the studio. And I want to add, that's just video over your network. So I don't want to use the capture card. I can use that. As the ambassador for NDI on Linux, because if you search for NDI on Linux, you yes. end up on the NDI webpage where they're like, here, Vin tells you how to do it. We don't know. Um, <laughs> I want to play around more with that, and it should give us a capacity to add more people to the shows live easier so we can bring in people and bring them out. Like I said, this is early days. This thing just showed up. I haven't cut it on yet. But what else do I have? Oh. Yeah, still got to put Debian on. Like I said, you do that. Yeah. OM1, OM2, OM3, OM4. I'm going to be showing people 
Mm. Probably next week, I'm going to get a video together about how to do budget, like 10 gig fiber and direct attached copper in your house. Because man, I watched, I watched a couple of videos on YouTube. Man, you got lucky on that. There's no way that, okay. You also, the YouTuber, YouTuber um, knowledge. Mm. Okay. <laughs> nah. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's frightening. And I only say that as somebody with a duffel bag of optical transceivers from a past life. <laughs> I'll give you a little education on it and how to do it. And uh, it's kind of fun. It'll be an interesting. But let's get into something that I found very interesting. So much so, I made a guide for it. This is part of my interfacing Linux series. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Awesome. A lot of people. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I want to play with DaVinci Resolve. I'm like, that's cool. Uh, but I got on my gaming video and I can't import it. And you're like, you know what? That's right. Because it's very unfortunate that MPEG-4 doesn't work with a free version of DaVinci Resolve on Linux. So step one is to spend real-time conversion, maybe an hour or however long you recorded, waiting for that video to transcode into like DNX HD. Well... You could record in DNX HD. You can right now with the current version of OBS that you have, but OBS is probably going to crash. The video is going to be bad. It's going to say media offline. You're going to get flashy red flames and all that fun stuff. The latest, latest versions of OBS for Linux have fixed that. So it is something you can do now. So you can record directly in OBS. Take that with your free version of DaVinci Resolve to play with. And DNX HD, import it right in. You're going to have your audio, you're going to have your video, and uh, you can figure out if that's something that you want to tango with. So answering that question, there it is. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. nice and simple. Um, you will have to build um, OBS from source. Now, thinking ahead, if you're a patron, I dropped that uh, on our patron page. I just released a preview video of this is how you compile OBS from source with a working browser that doesn't crash on Linux. I found a little <laughs> hack to make that work. So that's just, just a bonus soda I like to throw out. Uh, I think that'll go live for everyone Friday when I finish the guide. But um, yeah, that that's the thing I made. Hopefully that'll be helpful to somebody. <laughs> oh, yeah. I feel like I'm being stirred up. <laughs> hmm? Lots of podcasters. I don't expect videos from either of you. Maybe George. <laughs> <laughs> what's up next <laughs> up next we have braver and uh if you're looking at that logo thinking that looks a lot like the privacy badger nope that's it's... a lion <laughs> yeah, i'm sure that was uh, kinda, intentional yeah. <laughs> nope. uh, because braver is uh, a browser that basically takes what brave is doing and removes all of the crypto credit quote unquote features or the embedded quote unquote privacy respecting ads that it does uh, and it's basically just well it's just blink it's just chromium <laughs> so that's that's basically what they did uh, they took brave uh, took chromium and you know, removed all the Google bits and put their own uh, monetization in and uh, decided that, oh, let's let people share on the monetization by giving them, um, if they watch ads, they get social credit because that's what that is. Um, and um, Do you know something then strange they can spend... that people genuinely hmm. use those because... Oh, yeah. Like the bad thing, I mean, use them. Uh, I went to like log in. What is this bat thing? And I... This has been probably a year ago. Yeah. And I had billions of bat tokens, which I don't <laughs> yes. think there was any way or purpose or time to convert. It might have been like 30 cents or something. I don't know. I didn't look into it. And I was like, huh, people actually Yeah, use that. and most of it, there are mm -hmm. some sites that you can redeem those tokens for, say, Netflix uh, one month passes or literally mm. anything that would often require you to pay money on the internet that was the idea behind it but you know the idea of uh, forcefully building in ads and 
tracking stuff and the, the an entire crypto mining system into a browser, it made me not want to play with it. And uh, I guess the braver mm. people didn't want to play with it either. <laughs> this this seems yeah. like installing Chromium with a bunch of extra steps thrown in, Pedro. You're probably better off at Chromium, yeah. But it, if you don't want either the Google bits or the Brave specific bits, but you are, you know, you like want to be conscious about the privacy and whatnot. That's one of the things I don't get because Vivaldi and Brave, they've <laughs> both done like their own take on like the UI and just be it honest. That's the first thing. Can I cut all this nonsense off? I, I need you to be a browser. Come on, little buddy. Yeah. Just <laughs> open, open web pages. That's all we need. That, that's the end of our transaction. Oh. Which is why I'm starting to like uh, Firefox more and more. Mm. <laughs> well, I think this is a really cool uh, fork because Brave is actually very zip a zippy browser and it feels a lot faster than Chromium. So Brave minus ads and crypto should be even faster. And actually, this is very similar to the ungoogled Chromium browser we talked about a few weeks ago. But instead yep. of re removing Google <laughs> Web Services, it is removing the pay to surf features from the Brave browser. <laughs> and uh, I think this is a really cool project. And Braver is looking for contributors. So make sure to help out. It's hmm. really an awesome project. I'm down more options. It's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what we're all yes. secretly waiting for impatiently <laughs> is finally Something that's not Chrome, please. Yes, Internet yes, Explorer. Exactly. Edge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Edge is Chrome. <laughs> yeah. Vivaldi is Chromium. Chrome. <laughs> yeah, and that was a lion, Pedro. Come on. <laughs> uh, Gnome Shell. Oh, look. Pedro's about to lovingly explain why Gnome Shell and Mudder are awesome because oh, here being we go. the Gnome fan you and he is. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but I will say that on June 19th, uh, Tobias Bernard, one of the GNOME developers, uh, decided to share a bit, a very high level uh, overview of the roadmap that GNOME are going to try and follow for the foreseeable future, which uh, he starts off by going, he's like, oh, when we introduced it in 2010, and he skims a, a bit about the whole bit about people hating it, and just <laughs> goes like, oh, we had some hurdles, um, and we had to iterate very quickly in those few days, like, yeah, I wonder why that was, but... <laughs> He uh, makes some good points. Uh, GNOME 3, the way that it was first implemented, it was distraction-free. The other word for that would be bare bones, because there uh, was nothing this, this there. Is, uh, Pedro, I <laughs> like having to search for every time I want to open a thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's the other that's, bit. It's like, oh, uh -huh. just search. It's like, our search uh, is all-encompassing. Everything in the... Um, and the desktop and the settings, anything that you have bookmarked in the browser or a window that you have open in the browser, you can search for it there. It's like, there's something to be said when it comes to UI design. Now, here's that the thing. If here's you here's have a real question. to now, search. If it's something <laughs> yeah. that you typically use, can't you drag that over to that little bar thing they have on the left? Uh, you can right yeah. click and pin it to the favorites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to yes. search for it anymore. So that that is very helpful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But but, but yeah, it starts you know. off with nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so if you have to search for everything, and that is actually exactly. one of the weak points that they acknowledge. <laughs> it's like yeah, when you just start it, there's nothing. There's nothing there, and. That's not cool because it forces everyone to have to use the search because someone who's just come into GNOME, they're not going to know. They mm -hmm. don't know what you were thinking when you designed the UI, so they have to use the search. So you made yes. a whole desktop <laughs> environment that's completely pointless because everyone's using the search. Out of the box, you have, I would say it's a web browser, maps, clock an editor of some sorts, and possibly Sudoku. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, like, the bottom thing is actually the drawer that contains all the apps, Android style. Yeah. Well, you know, the interface <laughs> has improved visually, and Gnome Shell is so much faster, and I'm enjoying it more and more these days. But the app grid paradigm has always bothered me a bit. Um, you know, the... 
As a user that prefers traditional menu, the app grid seems disorganized and app discovery difficulty. And yes, you have to do lots of searching. And I don't like that there are several pages of apps to scroll through. Um, it's very similar to uh, the reasons why I don't like Mac OS. So, you know, you yeah, do get used to everything. Everything, yeah. Switch, uh, switch. switch workspaces instead of switching windows. It's like, oh, welcome uh, to, when was it, yes. 2003? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you, you, you do get used to it, but it's still a very cumbersome experience uh, for me. And honestly, I just wish there was a way to satisfy the, ne the needs of traditional menu users with that of... The grid layout, I am all for it because there are some advantages to the grid layout. So I could see a nice combination of the two uh, being an improvement <laughs> or, or giving it works just the well option. With a tablet. Yeah, it does you actually think? on touch. Um, <laughs> yeah, big icons. It's like, ooh, <laughs> but, <laughs> what Pedro meant to say is it looks like it would work well on it. It doesn't. <laughs> Ask me how I know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've had some good experience with GNOME on a tablet. You're also Gnome incapable Shadow. of providing me with criticism, so I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's but I why am I'm right here. now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, literally I'm doing throwing it in them a nice under way. the bus. I'm doing it in a nice way. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's GNOME. GNOME. This is GNOME's thing. I'm not going to ever yeah. like, waste time and energy going. Because the community's been doing it for well over a decade of like, we don't like this. And I'm just like, you're something else, which that, I'm down yeah. with that. They're like, this is our yeah. vision. This is how we're yes. going to rock and roll with it. Understand. Deal with it. <laughs> you can but, just use classic you know, gnome or, you know. You can use mate. You can use sediment. You can, exactly. You can what I'm use using a right now. Productive mate. desktop. <laughs> the superior, de the best desktop known to all of civil. You could use XFC, is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> I'm completely unbiased because that's only what I use. Uh, but I can't wait for that feedback. Somebody didn't listen to that last little part that they're going to catch it was being, you know, self referent Like, oh, you're just, oh, wait. Um, I like how the GNOME developers did not learn the lesson from KDE 4 because, you know, KDE 3 and GNOME 2 were the two big ones. Mm -hmm. And then KDE 4 came out and it was basically GNOME 2. It's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then GNOME 3 comes out. It's like, well, I wonder if KDE 4 has gotten any better. <laughs> I, GNOME 2, I used that for a few minutes because like, yeah, this has got to work. I'm down with this. Then, ooh. <laughs> but hey. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Some people like it. Good. It's all about yeah. choice. So exactly. I'm, I'm not going to hate on something I don't use because you can go use something else. And if you like it, go use that. <laughs> Unless yes. you're a hipster that likes to look cool at your disk <laughs> usage <laughs> in your terminal while writing your fixie. And it's very unsafe to do that because you can fall off your fixie and like damage your laptop, which you shouldn't have open while writing in your fixie, you hipster. <laughs> Strider, close your laptop. Um, wait, but... wait, wait, are you trying to say somebody? It's like I almost felt that someone, I felt they attacked. <laughs> I don't know. He's been quiet in Discord lately, you're, you're, so you're I figured I'd poke him a little bit. Thrown inside your head in a minute. <laughs> but yeah, this is a uh, disco knot. Uh, much like astronauts um, investigate astros, this one investigates your disk. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's just a command line. Um, it's It's got a, at least, um, I want to say, perceptible um, UI because each folder is spaced out and laid out according to its size it does um a sort of a, Fib a fibonacci mm -hmm. spiral of sorts and you have the biggest one and then they start getting progressively smaller until they get to a point where you run out of space in your terminal and you get those x's on the um on the side of the terminal there those are the, the small files and i would like an option because i did give this a go i would like an option to it's like okay i want to see the smaller files let me select mm -hmm. the x's but it doesn't um but when i first started reading it's like oh how does it work given a path on your hard drive um 
it scans and maps it to memory so that you could explore its contents while it's still scanning. It's like, wait a second. It maps everything to memory? That's going to numb all the RAM, like, immediately. <laughs> so what did I do? I downloaded the release. Uh, I put the executable on my um, Steam Games SSD, and I did disco not space dot. Oh, well, that didn't mm. numb all the RAM. It's just indexing everything to memory so that it you can browse very, very quickly and get I've been trying places. to tell you, man, for years you need to upgrade to, like, 8 gigs. <laughs> Aww. So, I do have 16, but uh, when it comes to, say, Chrome, mm -hmm. that don't mean much. <laughs> um, yeah, that's another issue. That's called using tabs as bookmarks. But... <laughs> I launched it on Debian 10, downloaded it, tried it, launched it, moved some stuff, and I'm like, yeah, that, that's stuff on my drive. Uh, okay. Uh, then I got back on my Fixie and wrote home. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was well, just disappointed I... <laughs> it didn't, you know, consume all my RAM. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's so funny, uh, and uh, uh, Pedro made me think of this. This it, Disco Knot is kind of like the golden rectangle of file management or file size management. <laughs> <laughs> so I used a cargo install Disco Knot on Ubuntu, and it worked great. And my largest size folder is Steam, of course. You know, most of us out there, <laughs> it's Steam here at Linux Gamecast. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, but it's it's really cool. It's an interactive graphical representation of file sizes and folders in CLI. And it reminds me a lot of and I was trying to remember the name of the software uh, um, GUI called X disk usage, but with minus the ability that didn't have the ability to delete files and folders. So but Disco Not has been pretty cool. I was really impressed by it. That's cool. Mm -hmm. It's a thing. It's there. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like disk usage mm -hmm. for me, I'm old school with like, I have a hard drive. They're dedicated for purposes. So, you know, that's I usually the best yeah. way to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't, yeah. especially not very like, effective, but it works. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's very effective when you're dealing uh, with like efficient, not effective. <laughs> efficient. <sighs> that was the word yeah. I was looking for. <laughs> no, no, no. I couldn't hear you over my ineffectiveness, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Look, my brain is ineffective, right? <laughs> especially in this heat. <laughs> Touche. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> Krita has Yay. been released. Yeah, it does. So Krita 4.3.0 has been released with lots of lots of new features and bug fi fixes. There's actually a whole new set of brush presets that are great for painting and watercolors. And you can now adjust the opacity and lightness on colored brush tips separately, which is has really been a, a much needed utility. And one of my favorite things um, is now it has multi-monitor setup support. You can have the canvas on one screen and the tools and settings on the other by going to the window menu and clicking new window. And oh, that was a really mode. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> so it was really nice on my my big three monitor system here. So I had the canvas in front of me and the tools on either side. And that that worked beautifully. And one of the other pieces of exciting news in this release is that the Android and Chrome OS beta for ARM and Intel of Krita has been released. It's it's still very beta. Not everything works yet. And of course, Krita works better with you know keyboard and mouse. But but they're working on that. And you know, touch screen support is very good in Krita. So it, it's coming. And that was really, really cool to be able to test it out. <laughs> it's awesome. Crit is definitely an interesting piece of kit. I've, uh, but I yes. say fortunately not had the need to use it. So I'm doing something right uh. in my life. And, but, you know, I still end up having to use Inkscape occasionally. So I'm also, yeah, yeah, uh, maybe yeah. I'll, I'll definitely look into that. I, I think one of the biggest issues um, with Krita is it doesn't, inspire me to eat butterflies <laughs> well it is a painting program and it assumes you have an artistic background 
to use it. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I want to be inspired to eat butterflies when I'm using um, painting projects. <laughs> oh, well, you yes, <laughs> yes, very good, man. So yes, he's speaking of a uh, photo GIMP. Um, this is a simple patch for GIMP two point uh, ten plus and. Pl uh, plus new versions to make GIMP look like Photoshop and to make it easier for Photoshop users to use GIMP. And there have been several of these in hey, the it's past. Got a flat pack. Good. Yeah, but it's got it yeah, only it's works got a flat with pack. flat packs. Correct. The, this <laughs> this patch is just for the flat pack version mm -hmm. of GIMP. Yeah, and you know the tools are organized <laughs> in the same position as Photos as in Photoshop, and keyboard shortcuts are similar to Photoshop. But one of the big um, differences between this and some of the previous uh, um, GIMP shop and um, extensions um, before this one is that there's hundreds of new fonts that are included, which is really awesome and, and helps from having to hunt for them. And it, it's just really nice to have a lot more fonts in the GIMP because a lot of people coming from Photoshop are used to having a lot of fonts or fonts they've bought. So, and at least the, these ones, uh, most of them are open source. So, it's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> and I used to tell people to install GIMP PS, which was, yes. um, it, it was just GIMP Photoshop. It was a theme that came with the Photoshop icons um, and changed the layout so you, you would only have the tools on the, uh, yeah. on the left side and everything else on the right with the um, work area in the middle. Yeah. Um, and for a while there, I stopped recommending that to people because it no longer worked when GIM 2.10 mm -hmm. came out. <laughs> Turns out someone actually went out of their way and, um, forked the, um, the Git and the install script. It basically pulls down everything and changes the config files to make yeah. um, GIMP automatically have the same layout as Photoshop. And it doesn't do like keyboard shortcuts. Those stay the same as they are in GIMP. So if you want those, you're going to have to do them yourself. But it works. It does work, yeah. And it it, it works with the non-flatback version too, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I spent 13 years using GIMP in multiple windows, it's too late mm -hmm. for me. So yeah, now, now, now you got to break them up into multiple windows. Mm, <laughs> just run it in yeah. normal mode. I don't use the yeah. Photoshop altogether mode. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. a silly mode. That's cute. Exactly. That's for people with one monitor. Um, yeah, hey. but, the, but this is really yeah, the cool. The one really expensive color calibrated sRGB4 monitor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Aww. Uh, <laughs> I'm just gonna go eat some more butterflies, man. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> it is a bit of an unfortunate picture. Let's talk yes. about rescue Zilla, man. What is it? It's an actively developed fork of the Redo Backup and Recovery Project. That's right, 64 nice. bits of awesome that hopefully you never have to use, but you should absolutely be familiar with it now this one this is just an update you know th this is a rescue thumb drive you used to go and rescue cds maybe a rescue floppy if you're ancient but this now has support for booting on efi only machines basically something made in the last decade <laughs> good on you <laughs> is this is this going to be useful Jill? yeah i mean you know they're they're i haven't i didn't play with it yet but I, I think it'll be very useful. Um, I'm actually used to using Gparted Live uh, to back up individual disk partitions uh, using a part image. Uh, but RescueZilla does back up the whole hard drive, which is, is really convenient. And it's, it's supposed to be similar to CloneZilla. So I think this can come yeah. in real handy. <laughs> they do make... Um the claim that they have made clonezilla and system rescue cd easy to use it's like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> bold claim there cotton bold claim um i'm more confused most... by anyone ever in the history of ever having an issue using clonezilla i'm like that's the legos of backup and restore <laughs> yeah <laughs> Again, what what did you do exactly to make them easier to use? Did you make a GUI for it? Is that what you're saying? Hey, man. Because I, I got a mascot. Yeah. Pretty easy to use. That's it. 
<laughs> it's like, okay, they're CLI tools. Ooh. But, um, no. <laughs> Paige is just like laughs in DD. Um, yeah. It's... I've been using it a lot lately. Do you know? Hi there, if... Patent Book. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's all I do to drives, man. It's like there's a snapshot and I get an ISO and I'm like, boop. Mm. And plop that back on in case of emergency, but most of the times, like all the boxes in here, man, I don't even bother with that. You know, I have home directories, I have config files like shoved up on Google Drive because it yeah. takes like eight minutes to install Debian. I'm like, why not? Let's just put it back on. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> all the important documents are backed up in three different places. Mm. So even if the whole system that is like, well, that's going to be an entire day of rebuilding. <laughs> I, I've said the first half of that <laughs> but it, it was very much like a Jack Nicholson smile um, in um, yeah, here's Johnny mood when, yeah, when it's like yeah, yeah it's gonna be great it's gonna be brilliant but <laughs> let that not be the last we speak of USB solutions on Linux. Yeah. So this is a really cool utility that I, you know, that us podcasters who do a lot of uh, distro testing, um, this really makes it handy. This, this is Ventoy. It's an open source tool to create a bootable USB drive from multiple, multiple, yes, ISO files. You just run the Ventoy script to a flash drive, and then you, you can copy many ISO files at a time using command line or your favorite file manager. And it will, Ventoy will boot with a boot menu to select them. And this is a big deal because a lot of the other options out there don't have, you know, drag and drop abil ability for the ISOs and you have to format the disks and it can be really complicated if you, you want to boot multiple distros. And, and you um, basically have to reflash yeah. the whole thing. It's like, I want exactly. to add just one more OS. Every nope, time. The whole thing. <laughs> Every time. And it also supports legacy BIOS as well as UEFI. And some of them don't support UEFI very well right now. So yeah. this is this is you net booting. Um, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, <shame>. uh, yeah. <laughs> but I love you net booting anyways. But yes, you can even boot not just from Linux ISOs, but any uh, disk operating system you would like, including Windows 10, it autom automatically boots Windows 10. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Having so a Swiss it's, Army it's really... boot stick's probably not a bad idea. You can keep everything on one drive, so when you lose it, yeah. it's all gone <laughs> yes. at one time. I mean, it's very yes. efficient. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's I a just, good way to, you know, stop people from doing it. <laughs> yeah. And I just like, because I have, you know, literally over 50 flash drives that I use for testing distros from, from everywhere from LWW to Big Daddy Linux um, to Destination Linux and some of the other shows that I go on. And it's nice just to have one flash drive that I can copy all those ISOs to. <laughs> it's just, it saves money. It saves time. It's quicker. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah, back in the day when I was uh, effectively doing the distro hopping, um, 2009, 2010-ish. Yeah. That one, that <laughs> would have been very helpful back then. Yeah, very, very definitely. helpful. <laughs> so now on LWW going forward, it just makes it a lot easier for us <laughs> to test distros. <laughs> I don't test distros, by the way. I'm getting lumped into this. Uh, me and Pedro do that. Yeah. I, 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 I gotta I get have back. a bunch of laptops that I want to, you know, yes. <laughs> play with. We, yeah, we, we put our distros on, on, on all our machines. <laughs> so I'm too busy actually doing stuff. But coming up next, <laughs> LibNDI. It's fun, so let's use it, kids. What is it? You've never heard of it? Well, NDI is a great piece of kit. If you want to transfer, you know, you don't want to use capture cards or anything like that, you can send it over a gigabit network, and it looks really good. doesn't require a lot of horsepower. Basically, if you get got a box that can stream a little bit of overhead, you can use LibNDI at home, and it's fun, I guess. I don't know. Man, the goal for this project is to provide a way to interact with NDI streams without requiring the use of non-open source software, basically the SDK provided by NewTek. 
it's nice and alpha right now, though, so you want to keep that mm. in mind. There's a lot left to do. But uh, it only supports receiving right now, so you could be sending through a source like OBS Browser, not OBS Browser, but the uh, OBS NDI plugin, and send it over your network to another computer. This will pick it up. It'll do that. Um, I, w I want to see more of this developed. I want more people to play with it because, you know, there, there's uh, like, oh, I won't use it unless it's completely open source. And I use a lot of stuff that's not open source because that's not where, that's not a hill I'm going to die on because we're still working mm -hmm. on. Let's get mm -hmm. Linux adopted. You know, take your <laughs> gatekeeping nonsense, you know, over yeah. there for now. Uh, we'll get to that <laughs> in a minute. Um, I love reverse engineering. And that's what this guy's doing, man. So he's just working it back and Very it's kind of cool. brilliant. I, I want to play with it. What I really want to see is the, and I'd like it from New Tech if they would release it. They Something to the Windows equivalent to where in DI, you could create a virtual cam that you could send to. Like, let's say I needed exactly what I'm doing with you, uh, Pedro and Jordan, or see, not Pedro and Jordan, Jill and Jordan. You don't get to be Jordan and that'll be Jordan Saturday. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, different, you take three yeah, on different that? person <laughs> no no i was just <laughs> cutting you off man because jill was gonna be like oh i get to be jordan now i'm like no no we take turns <laughs> and what i got to do with to get the return video back so you know we can interact with each other is that's got to go through a capture card that sends that out over hdmi splitters which comes into two other capture cards in these boxes what I'd like is just to be able to send an NDI source out to both of these boxes over the network and use a V4 L2 loopback device and just tie that in directly. I know it's possible. You just have to build FFmpeg with NDI support. Then you got to set up, you got to do the right FFmpeg incantations. I'm not going to bore you with all that. Mm. You get over the network, <laughs> then you create a loopback device, then you could put that in to a something that Chrome can pick up. Ask me how I know I've tried this out, but man, that was a, there's no way to automate this. So that's what I'd like to see. There's something to work on. That's cool. Yeah. Awesome. What are your thoughts on this, Pedro? I can tell that you were engrossed by. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking of the way of actually automating that, but it's possible. I don't have the necessary knowledge to know how to do it, but I know that it can be done. Mm. Someone smarter than me required. I can show you how to do it, Pedro. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy to do, but but this is go look at NDI, especially if you're thinking about setting up a dual stream system. I would love to have everything on the network because then you don't need HDMI cables. Like I've already moved all of our audio mm. to network and all those cables. I have a closet just gone. Just that's, I don't have to deal with that anymore. You know, it's one or two ether noodles. So good work with that. Hey, if you want to finance some of the uh, shenanigans, the Frankenstein, shenanigans. Labs, <laughs> some of the Ventac that rolls out of the studio, <laughs> the weird, strange, bizarre things we like to make Linux do, you can head over to patreon.com and be one of the fantastic. Nay, sparkly, sparkly people <laughs> that help support yes. it. Um, that's patreon.com forward slash Linux Gamecast. We got a gang of levels, all six levels. It's kind of brilliant. <laughs> what? It's not a very Including, big gang, but it's a gang. Yeah. <laughs> okay, sweetness. Uh, <laughs> I, I need to know more about your uh, gang dynamic theory and what qualifies as a gang. I suppose <laughs> two people qualify as a gang? Yeah. <laughs> That's a polite way of going. I was just making stuff up, man. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> like we're I said, it's not a very big gang, <laughs> but yeah. it's a gang. <laughs> we're more than a gang, we're a community. So. Gang. Um, <laughs> cult. We get another thing. Yes. <laughs> we are technically a cult because we're not tax exempt. Once we get tax exempt, we'll no longer be a cult. <laughs> <laughs> we got a wish zone uh, for all the stuff in the studio if you do that you end up back here on this wall uh, we will shame you each and every week uh, plus if you pick up anything on our wish zones for myself Pedro, Jill or Jordan we have to read a note that you send us do with that what you will um, it's one of the dumbest <laughs> ideas we've ever came up with you know I'm kind of surprised that no one's 
Really? <laughs> Gone ham? <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> oh, well, it'll never make it past post. That's like one of the issues. <laughs> also, uh, it'd be cool if you want to swing into our Discord. That's where we're hanging out the other six days of the week. We're actually in there, man. Uh, we're chatting. We're going back and forth and uh, doing all that stuff. Plus, uh, yeah, that's that. Keep being awesome. Thanks for letting us do this. Now, uh, tis the season. Mm hmm. Pumpkin oh, pie. Um, it's a little <laughs> early yet, but it's getting closer. <laughs> it's not quite Halloween yet <laughs> or fall. <laughs> Just start of summer. <laughs> so U.S. centric. Australia would like a word. <laughs> <laughs> Hipster pie. Go back in time. Yes. The Raspberry Pi powered radio. Look at that. 1980s. My delete expletive. Um. No, <laughs> that's that's not the 1980s. Not not even by a little bit. Unless we're talking <laughs> yeah. about the genre of music, you can make it play yes. because Alex created a radio time machine. It covers ten decades of music from the 20s up to the 2020s. Basically, uh, yeah, there's a Reddit post with a build machine, uh, build machine, build instructions, all that fun stuff in there. Not much to it, man. A Pi Four, which you probably get away with like a Pi Zero with this. Some RGBs, get a button. You got vintage Bluetooth radio, which really okay <laughs> basically it's just the housing you just get yeah. literally any bluetooth speaker housing that'll fit a raspberry pi and the arduino bits you're good <laughs> uh, it's, i love that people do stuff like this but just there's a huge chunk of my brain going why <laughs> Oh, well, it's cool. They actually did a really nice job with the uh, the playlist for each decade. Like I like the 80s one had lots of uh, jazzercise, which I used to have to dance to years ago. Oh. <laughs> so. Yeah, I didn't know Muppety was a thing or Muppety uh, yes. since it only has the one P. Um, but yeah, Muppety. no, that seems mm. interesting. It can pull music from your local library as well as like last fm spotify everything else basically yeah. and you could just make a um playlist out of that it's very I, nice i i applaud both of you on <laughs> being able to get past the fact that they're vintage us uh, bluetooth radios yeah uh, yeah <laughs> i i pulled over no. at that point i'm like <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> Then, as the hipster uh, of this community, you should know about those things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Van, I do have a tube radio in that in the house, but it's too big and too heavy for me to show it to you right now. So. <laughs> but you can put a Raspberry Pi in it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't know when I think about like Bluetooth headsets. I was like, can, can we get a Bluetooth eight track player? Yeah. Yeah, those do exist, actually, and cassette players. <laughs> I've looked into I them. was going to say I wouldn't be surprised if that existed, but there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, some people have taste. Then again, some people don't. So <laughs> You're the ones listening to this. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I, that was directly at you, Pedro. Not, not the <laughs> I don't, want, I don't want any confusion. <laughs> Deflection. <laughs> tell us, tell them where they can send their tasty, tasty hot takes. Yes, you can send us your hot takes by uh, literally brandishing a branding iron and um, poking us in the butt, or preferably, uh, please, mm -hmm. oh God, uh, go to latestgamecast.com, hit the contact button, and fill out the form. Make sure your um, <laughs> feedback goes to LWDW on the little show box, because if not, well, you might get a very foul-mouthed reply for that Saturday hot mail. Hot mail? No. Hate mail. Hot mail. Hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aww. a hot mail right now, but that's because I'm very, very warm. <laughs> Here on LWW, it's love mail, not hate mail. <laughs> From now on, it will only be referred to as pain mail on this show. <laughs> so saith the one-eyed pop filter. We are not to question it. Yes. 
<laughs> you lost the tonight, Cyclop Pedro. filter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Cyclop filter. <laughs> we know not of its mysterious ways, only its power and its vengeance. <laughs> Nay, be the one. Um, <laughs> check it out, man. Uh, this one got rolled around. I threw this in. Then I, I, I already had this story so cool. in before uh, this showed yeah. up. But I just wanted to go ahead and uh, Aram wrote back. And he's like, oh, man, hey, I, I'm an open source developer. And in the past, uh, you reviewed one of my applications. Bandvich. Yes. Which I got that far. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> this could really go one of two ways. Um <laughs> So since I remember you liked it, nice. Uh, I Phew. thought you might be interested in the new application I just released. Discodot. Hey, Yay. buddy. It was already in the notes, but uh, let's just go ahead and put a bow on it. I personally think it's very cool, though I might be a little biased. Nah, nah. A little bit. Not really. Not if you're like me, man. I hate everything. I might be like, get out of there. I don't ever want to see you again. And I'm looking to get it to a wider audience. Um, if you like it and or would like to review it, that would be great. But hey, I think we all installed it. We all used it. Yeah. Yep. Two out of three. And we not continue bad, to right? use it. <laughs> yeah, and you know his his previous app, app Bandwitch was the network monitoring real time network monitoring on the Klee, and that was really awesome. We did really like it. So thank you for the the mail, Aram. <laughs> Which um, Bandwitch is actually on the NAS, and if I have to SSH yes. in there for any reason, cool. it comes on. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> That's one of those man's like, yeah, something's broke. That's one of those yeah, something's broke. Yeah. SSH commands. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. I don't, I don't even have a key for this box. Jeez, that's when you know you type in a password. Like, oh. Yeah, no, that was a cheap micro ATX uh, case from eBay, and the TFX mm -hmm. power supply that I already had ended up having to buy a different motherboard because I'd fried the other one. Mm. But yeah, it's still working. Uh, Two months uptime now, so we'll see if it nice. breaks. <laughs> it's a phase. He will get out of it, but um... <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> it's supposed to be on, and it idles at three watts. You you can set timers to cut it off when you're doing things like I don't know being unconscious <laughs> in the house. <laughs> eh, I pay the same. <laughs> all through the year, electricity wise. So, yeah. <laughs> I forgot one of those sweet deals. I, I, it was uh, this is completely off the topic. Be, be careful with your power <laughs> consumption. Just like it's good yeah. for everybody. That money's <laughs> always a factor, but it's just not. You know, don't walk it's around a the tiny house. Apartment too. Do a wielding oh. blow dryers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Here in Kelly, if you're not using it, you keep it off. That's <laughs> just what we do here. <laughs> So uh, mm -hmm. I turn every, everything else off. It, the NAS is the only thing that stays that running stayed. through the night. Yeah, of course. <laughs> nope. I don't even do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, actually, I haven't ran a server in ages and kept it on 24 hours. I used to back in the day, but, but don't not worry. anymore. You, don't, you make up for it with all of your vintage power sucking devices. Like horribly <laughs> do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Like, do, yeah, yes. don't worry. There's with all things, there's balance. You cut this yeah. out. Jeez. Yeah, that's true. Jill turns on one of her vintage systems and it's like, why is why is this sucking 20 kilowatts? Oh, okay. <laughs> kilowatts. Yeah, I'm just gonna leave that alone. We got to get up here, everyone. Thanks for showing up. Uh, we'll see you next week. It's gonna be brilliant. All right, we're gonna roll some credits. Let's do it. Yay! Oh. So much fun. Hi, Netflix. You sent me another uh, thing that I just booted, by the way. Oh, boy. Come at me. Again. <laughs> so they really want our business. Them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's still a bot. Man, I, I just, just come on. Fight me. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it will be great for viewership to take Netflix to court. <laughs> Uh, you think you can get um, Leonard French? <laughs> Possibly. Oh. Because I'm sure he'd love one of them cases. <laughs> Be awesome. <laughs> wow. LWW 228. Amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. We'll see you next week.
Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> See, you think about it sometimes, and you're just like, nah, let that one go. <laughs>